Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, Naimbag nga malam tayo amin. Ape kas lang nga we all feel cold ba in teatro amyanan? <laughs> Yan. So this afternoon we are very uh, lucky to have or to host the 28th Humphrey Voices series in partnership of course with the University of uh, the Philippines, Baguio. Uh, of course, with the coordination of Cordillera Studies Center. So this afternoon, we have with us uh, local government unit representatives, uh, students from the University of the Philippines, Baguio. Of course, the Humphrey Fellow alumni who are here. And dito po sila. Pakitaas yung kamay. Ayan. There are 12 Humphrey Fellow alumni who are here. And uh, our lecturer who is with us also, we have architect Rachel Fajash. Tama ba yun? Yes, thank you. To start with, may we all stand for the singing of the national anthem. And uh, this will be followed by the welcome remarks to be given by no less than the Chancellor of UP Baguio, Dr. Raimundo Di Rubilius. Chancellor of UP Baguio, Dr. Raimundo Di Rubilius. Honorable Governor Pedro Mayamo of Ifugao, um, the Hubert Humphrey Alumni Philippines, headed by its president, Mr. Arnel Banyas. Our guests from UP Los Banos, UP Diliman, LGU of Tuba, NCIP Ifugao, PDRRMO Benguet, University of Baguio, Nedakar, St. Louis University, and University of the Cordilleras, Tepteba Foundation, our um, students and faculty at UP Baguio, good afternoon. Um, on behalf of the UP Baguio faculty and staff and students, I'd like to um, thank the Hubert Humphrey Alumni Philippines for choosing to bring this uh, um, lecture voices, Humph Humphrey voices uh, here in UP Baguio, um, which I guess it's, it's just an, the perfect place for a topic like this because uh, UP Baguio has had, had always uh, privileged and valued indigenous knowledge as a, an important and as a valuable knowledge as other knowledges like Western knowledge. Um, in fact, when we uh, established the Knowledge Training and Resource Center for Climate Change Adaptation and DRRM under the auspices of Cordillera Studies Center uh, in the year 2012, um, one of the priority uh, topics then was already on landslide um, management and slope management. Um, and that's why I'm ha happy that one of the, our reactor is uh, here this afternoon. Uh, Dean uh, D. Nolasco, who's a geologist. So it will be an interesting uh, forum, a dialogue between traditional knowledge and um, what we call Western, maybe geophysical knowledge. And, and that is what we want to happen. Uh, we want more and more conversations, uh, dialogues between bearers and um, 
scholars on traditional knowledge in various fields of knowledge or knowledges and um, other forms or other types of knowledges like Western knowledge. The topic is quite um, relevant and quite timely because as you know, uh, with the recent uh, typhoons that we uh, suffered, uh, we experienced in the Cordillera, we know of the, the devastation that uh, these typhoons caused because, um, because of the landslides. And in the UNFCCN, United Nations frame, um, Framework on Climate Change Adaptation, they already identified uh, landslides as uh, one risk and one vulnerability of people living in the mountainous areas like the Cordillera. Um, and so uh, this, this kind of studies are quite important for us and I hope that it is really disseminated as widely as possible, especially with um, uh, for people involved in disaster risk reduction and management. I'd like to thank our resource person, architect Rachel Gimbatan Fajas, for um, coming here and sharing her uh, knowledge to, to us here in UP Baguio, uh, Baguio City and the Cordilleras. Welcome to our nice theater. This, this was launched, <laughs> Teatro Amiana, this was la launched only last year. Um, and this is really a giving tribute to the old uh, open theater that we used to have here in the 1950s and 60s. Magandang hapon po sa ating lahat at uh, welcome ulit sa UP Baguio. Thank you very much. Maraming salamat, Chancellor Robilius, for the very enlightening sharing this afternoon. And thank you for bringing us here to Teatro Amianan. And to uh, give a message, we have here the president of the Hubert Humphrey Alumni Philippines, Attorney Arnel Banyas. Chancellor Raimundo Revillos, um, Governor Pedro Mayamo, distinguished guests, my dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, nimbag nga aldaw kada kayo amin apo. Let me begin by expressing how grateful the Hubert H. Humphrey Alumni Philippines um, for the support of our friends at the Cordillera Sadi Center and the University of the Philippines, Baguio, for their generosity and hospitality in hosting today's forum. Our event this afternoon is quite significant as we discuss a topic that is relevant, timely, and close to our hearts. Also, it is a privilege for us to have this forum at UP Baguio as 2019 marks the 40th global anniversary of the Humphrey Program. At this point, allow me to briefly introduce the Hubert H. Humphrey Fellowship. It provides 10 months of non-degree academic study and professional enrichment in the United States for mid-career professionals from designated countries. It is managed in the Philippines by the Philippine American Educational Foundation, also called the Fulbright Commission. Humphrey Fellows go through a rigorous international selection process, which begins as he, at his or her home country. They are chosen by the United States, the, by the U.S. State Department, based on different criteria, which include, among others, their potential for leadership and their commitment to public service in either the public or private sector. More than 5,000 men and women, of which 120 are Filipinos, have been honored as Humphrey Fellows since the program began in 1978. There is no guaranteed number of fellows for each country, so each nominee has to compete with other finalists from around the world. They are hosted by major universities in the United States. In the Philippines, an average of only three fellows per year have been selected in the past 39 years. We have fellows who are members of the police force, medical doctors, engineers, teachers, environmentalists, bankers, lawyers, local executives, judges, human rights advocates, architects, agriculturists, and even a priest, to name some. Let me take this opportunity to invite you or someone you know to consider applying for a Hubert H. Humphrey Fellowship in the future. The search for the 2019-2020 fellows will soon open. I have the honor to introduce the 12 fellows who are present here today. They are Carmen Bolinto from Emory University. Kindly stand, Carmen. And Attorney Katrin Cadiente, American University. DO, is um, DOJ Assistant Secretary Chit Daitek already here? Uh, our MC, Soraya Fakulo from Vanderbilt University. 
architect, well, architect Rachel Gimbatan Fajas from Cornell University will be introduced later. UPLB Vice Chancellor Dr. Serly Hamyas from the University of Maryland. Esther Liknachan from Syracuse University. Uh, Superintendent, Police Superintendent Romel Miranda, University of Minnesota. Police Superintendent Kimberly Molitas, University of Minnesota. Uh, Ms. Susa Manodi Kandao, Rutgers State University of New Jersey. Let me emphasize that the, Humph the, the Humphrey Alumni Philippines is an association of scholars. It is non-political and non-sectarian. Whatever opinion or stand our speakers may have is their own and not of the Humphrey Alumni Philippines. Again, our big thanks to our speaker and reactors for sharing their expertise and thoughts with us today. Our main speaker this afternoon, my batchmate, although now based overseas, has a heart that still beats for her beloved province and country. Hindi siya nakakalimot. Again, my gratitude to the University of the Philippines, Baguio, Cordillera Sadi Center, Chancellor Ray Ruvillos, Vice Chancellor Corazon Abansi, Leia Apaya, Ruth Tindaan, Paula Pamintuan Riva, Humphrey Fellow Soraya Fakulo, and all of you for making today's forum happen. Kung minsan ang solusyon sa ating problema ay malapit lang sa atin, kailangan lang nating magtanong at makinig. Sana po ay maging um, matagumpay ang ating hapon. Maraming salamat po sa inyong lahat. Maraming maraming salamat, Arnel. Yan. So yung mga interesado, those who are interested na mag-apply for the program, andito yung mga 12 fellows whom you can network with later on. So Arnel and the two others uh, are also with the Senate of the Philippines. Nakalimutan niyang sabihin. Yan. Um, let me introduce our lecturer, our main speaker for this afternoon. Si Architect Rachel Gimbatan Fajash. She's here wearing the traditional Ifugao attire and is supported by the very um, active governor, Sanasi Governor Mayamo, of the province of Ifugao. Thank you so, so much, sir, for coming. Um, see, see, Architect Rachel has been involved for much of her life in mapping as a mapping researcher, as a planning specialist, and a program manager, especially in the area in the area of land use and development planning in protected areas lived in by indigenous people. So akmang akma sa atin to. So he, she is a full-blooded Ifugao and wants to emphasize that she is from both the Tuwali and Ayangan ethno groups. And um, much of her much of her college and education has been spent in the University of the Philippines, Diliman, Quezon City. Uh, she, graduated, she graduated at Urban and Regional Planning at the University of the Philippines, Bachelor of Science in Architecture, and also is a licensed environmental planner and a licensed architect, and of course, an alumna of the Fulbright Hubert Humphrey Fellow. She also has published some articles. No? She's the co-author of Misunderstanding the Notion of Conservation in the Philippine Rice Terraces, Cultural Landscapes, International Social Science Journal, which was published in December of 2006. And the other is um, the other journal that he led no? as an author is The Effects of Tourism and the Environment in Asia and the Pacific. Ladies and gentlemen, let's all welcome architect Rachel Gimbatan Fajash. Thank you very much for that nice introduction. Um, I'm happy to be here. The last time I was here in UP Baguio is in, was in um, 2006. I was here then with my NGO, the Save the Ifugao Races Movement. Oh, can someone help me? Um, oh, okay. I 
I was here with my NGO that saved the Ifugao Traces movement uh, to uh, explore future work possibilities with the Cordillera Studies Center and um, maybe uh, exchange knowledge with them uh, for an indigenous knowledge program that I was then starting to coordinate. That same year, I got shortlisted for the Hubert Humphrey Fellowship. So standing here before you, I feel that uh, everything is coming full circle. I am presenting this in two parts. The first one will be an introduction of the idea. It's a methodology of utilizing indigenous knowledge in landslide risk mapping. The second part will be some recommendations and some issues and concerns. April 30, 2009, I was then coordinating an indigenous knowledge program. We were um, having a meeting at this place. It was the backyard of one of my uh, teammates. Nice view, with a nice view of the other town. It's on a slope, very windy. But this was the last photo, I think, of that site. Barely a week after this photo was taken. The ground on he where he was prancing on disappeared. It eroded, bringing down with it an entire house and its occupants. Only one survived. So you can barely even see any house there. In a nearby part of town, that's my town, Kiangan, where the national road uh, of along the national road is another big landslide which buried an entire family downhill and in another town a church that was built on the uphill side of the road was completely washed out bringing down with it another house and its occupants along its path downhill. The entire town was sh shocked. It was not a time for us even to expect any disaster. That was early May, but uh, the rains came after a long dry spell. And nothing like this happened within our living memory. We are used to landslides but they happen on the rougher parts of the road, in uninhabited areas, in other parts, not in our poblacion, not where we were living. And then I realized something. The spot where this happened is what we have always called gode, which in Ifugao means landslide. The slope where it happened is also called Domang, which means that slope across the gully or that slope across the ravine. And it belonged to a mountain overlooking the town, which is called Atade, which derived its name from the term erosion. So it means tends to erode. And in the, the landslide in the other part of town, in, in, in another town, this is what we have always called gohang, which in our vernacular means cut by landslide. In the rice terraces, gohang is also the drainage, what we call the drainage channels, where excessive water from the top of the mountain are diverted so that it would not uh, go directly to the rice terraces. It was, it's diverted from uh, in uh, big channels of water, canals, from the top of the mountain to the rivers below. It is also a term, it can also be used as a verb, which means to cut the earth to permit water to flow down. Apparently, there is a direct relationship to the names that these places acquired. 
and the recurrence of that event or disaster. Indigenous knowledge. It's our intellectual heritage. Where do this come from? Where do we draw this from? Anyone? Anyone? From the students? Of course, we, it comes from the indigenous peoples, from interaction with the people. How? It comes from the community. I did not take this research for the take of research. It was out of a frustration as an urban planner in need of base maps that really show um, susceptible areas, risk susceptible areas. So um, I have a bias to what works, a bias for something or an information that really works within my local community. And uh, to do that, it has to be an official map, a recognized map that everyone who is concerned in making it would acknowledge. So I channeled this research through the government system. And then I made my intervention through its technical parts. So this is the protocol I followed. So the community uh, workshop or interaction with the community is just the third part of the process. First, I made a survey on existing maps that are available that are helpful and doing similar things that uh, similar, similar to what I have in mind. And then I coordinated with concerned agencies for uh, its FPIC. Uh, I sent someone to talk with Esther and um, in coordination also with the head of the Provincial Disaster Risk Reduction Office. So I coordinated with them. The head of that uh, office then was my friend. So it was a bit easier. And it was them who coordinated the workshops in the community. If I don't do this, then I would probably uh, experience some resistance because even if I'm from that place, I'm still an outsider. Like I'm, I don't have any government personality. I wanted something that would work. So I dinaan ko sa government and it was them who coordinated it. The people really participated. And then the fourth step is the statistical analysis. This is mostly desk job, which are then uh, validated with uh, the community. Since I'm a local, I, I know which places are really susceptible and I know which are not. So this is the protocol I followed. Of course, I will talk about the methodology later. Let us put ourselves into perspective uh, this is the world map without the north and south uh, poles. Uh, it's, it looks a bit odd because I tried to place the Philippines at the center. The Philippines lies along the Pacific Ring of Fire. 81% of the world's biggest earthquake occur here. And I think 90% of earthquakes also occur here. This is because this is a nearly uh, continuous line of um, volcanic um, arcs, um, plate movements, and oceanic trenches. Also, this is a um, nearly 150 years track of tropical cyclones. As you can see, the Philippines is nearly obliterated by 
Category 5 typhoons. It is the most exposed country to disaster. In the Philippines, we are experiencing at least 20 typhoons a year. Five of that is devastating. Of course, on the north, where my project is, this is the Philippine Cordilleras. On its uh, south, uh, eastern is Ifugao, this one. Northwestern parts of the province is mountainous, having, um, and 67% of that has a uh, um, slope steepness index of 30% and above. And this is my project area. 129 kilometer stretch of the road taking two kilometers from both sides. Later on, I had included uh, two municipalities, the municipalities of Kiangan and Mayuyao. These are municipalities at both ends of the road. And of course, the three pilot barangays. This is the national road. It is a cut on the slope, which makes it a natural hazard. During heavy precipitation, loose soil and um, erosion, landslides happen from the uphill side of the road, which is easily cleaned, or it happens on the downhill part of the road, which will take months to recover. This, month, this, this one took more than a year to be fixed. So we go now to what happens in the community. In my pilot area, the barangay is called Hulongan. It came from the word Hulong, which means um, to move upstream. It follows, it mimics the movement of an eel going upstream. So definitely there is uh, water in that area. And what we did was to use Google Map armed with a pocket Wi-Fi because that's, uh, we have signal in that area. We um, pinpointed the names of the places of that place. We have here Mumbungog, Naduntug. And then we also map the landslide prone areas, same area. And then we translated the names or may, uh, discussed them. But uh, in discussing them, it was easier to understand it by defining it in English. So mumbugo, mumbungog means roaring water. Naduntug means nol. Madanu means watery, nudbukul, protruded. protruded. Um, does that sound familiar to you in Baguio City? We have. Chanum and Chuntug Street. So how do we integrate? It's easy to map them out. How do we integrate them and include them in the landslide susceptibility map? That is a very technical uh, work. So first, let us uh, take a good look at how they do it, the technical people do it, or the, how the mappers do it. There are two basic informations that they need landslide inventory, and uh, probable causative factors. Landslide inventory is, of course, taken from consultation with the communities and site survey. If they don't do that, you will not really have a good landslide susceptibility map. And causative factors are um, probable causes of the landslides that um, the mappers think are uh, the causes of that landslide in that area. It can be elevation, slope angle, slope aspect, curvature, topographic wetness index, distance to fall, uh, the geologic um, uh, configuration of the place, the vegetation, so everything. It can go up to more than 20 causative factors. And then these are weighted for how much they influence landslide in that area. 
there is a formula for this. And the result of that is the landslide susceptibility map. Uh, they add all this weighted evidence, the result of that is the landslide susceptibility map. To uh, illustrate that, um, did any one of you um, make Halo Halo? Or anyone who experienced even watching uh, people make Halo Halo and serving it to you? Uh, not the Chow King. I would like to illustrate that to you. Banana, saba, di ba? Leche, leche flan, ube. Milk, sago. Buko. Ah, pinipi. Sugar. Is this enough? Ano pa? Have you ever tried uh, adding langka? Anyone who has tried adding melon, cantaloupe? How does it taste? I tasted uh, halo halo with cantaloupe or melon. I tried. Can you even taste the other ingredients if you add two tablespoons of melon? The taste is really overpowering that you cannot taste or appreciate other ingredients of the halo-halo. If you put melon, parang melon, ano na yun? Melon shake. Uh, same thing with the strong flavor of langka. Sometimes it really overpowers the other ingredients that that's the only taste um, it has. In the same manner that mappers do this is arbitrary, actually. They add in factors and process them, and that makes the landslide susceptibility map. Kung hindi naman ikaw ang titikim sa halo-halo mo, you will not really uh, be sensitive on what to put. Kay ano-ano, halo-halo naman yan eh. So it's halo-halo, so it's... Um, this is where indigenous knowledge of place names come in. So this is the usual methodology. When we map place names, we identify causative factors from etymology of the place. So it's, uh, you are given prior knowledge of what causes landslides, even from studying the place names. So, ang ginagawa nito, it's a, it's a sieve. What's the Tagalog term for sieve? Sala. Sagat. Saga, oh. In Il Ilocano, it's uh, sag sagatin na amin uh, J, um, of the ingredients, all the causative factors. And then these are weighed also for their influence of causing landslide. So this is the intervention. 
it's no longer arbitrary because this one, causative factors, in usual mapping is usually arbitrary. They put in all other ingredients that they think is causing the landslide in that area. But if we consult with the people and identify, help them identify what causes landslide, even by just studying place names, then you are given prior knowledge or of possible uh, causative factors of the landslide. How do we do that? So this is a sample of a matrix. First, two columns are place names and association to risk and tendencies. The third one is uh, an analysis of that. So example, place name, bangaan. It means spotlight because it's the, the entire uh, barangay looks like the side of a pot. Concave and concave. Association to risk and tendencies. It is a collector of debris slides from uphill. Whatever comes from uphill, you collect niya because it's, it's a container. Therefore, the tendency is channel erosion too. Erosion among all the uh, canals that are uh, running through that container. And then we have domang. Uh, in Tuali, that means that uh, slope across the gully. In uh, another town, it's also called Chumang. So it's medyo binago yung uh, language, but it's the same. And this is the information I got. There were historic big slides from 20 to 50 year intervals. And uh, tenzen, tendency of that is real erosion every year. And then we have Bungubungna, which means this is a, uh, a name of a region where I come from. It means far up, upstream where water comes from. Tendencies, channelized discharge of debris, rockfall, and real erosion. So the potential causative factors, these are already technical terms. Curvature, what causes the landslide? It's the curvature. It is all plan, either plan curvature or profile curvature. Slope steepness, nearness to drainage, drainage density can be the probable causative factors of the landslide. Nearness to drainage, so everything is taken from the place name. These are possible factors. And then, of course, they are weighed again. This is the formula. I will no longer talk about that because it took me months to study it and um, until it's, it was the only thing that I could understand. And these are my chosen ingredients for my landslide susceptibility map. Added them all, and this is the result. This is the section of the road that I studied. So let us take a good look of the map. This is the 129 kilometer stretch of the road. This is one barangay. Zoom in, further zooming in. This is the map that the community wants to see. Here you can see building outlines, rice terraces, agricultural areas, and the road. How far the um, highly susceptible areas are from their houses. So it's all scaled for the community. Here, engineering interventions can also be delineated. Like for instance, you can uh, propose for um, alternative access route if there's a landslide in that area. And it also makes a good communication tool to politicians if you want help from them and also for politicians to use if they want to show that they really need help 
in that area. It's very clear. The information is clear. Now, compare that to the what we have, what the town has. Uh, are the D and R here? This is a map from the Mines and Geosciences Bureau. And it shows my entire town with small spots in, uh, inside as the safe areas. And this is the one we mapped, the barangay. Of course, in this map, it's all red. So everything is high, highly susceptible to landslide. But we know that there are some, not too, some areas that are not too susceptible to landslide and some safe areas too. So here, we can also uh, use this for, this is again, um, excuse me, this is the provincial uh, landslide susceptibility map. The um, barangay landslide susceptibility map can be used for land use planning because you can delineate areas for building and areas for passive use in areas for other uses. So, this, in my, um, from my perspective, is what works. But as we know, community-based mapping and planning is very tedious. It's also very expensive. And that's the issue that we have today. That's the reality. But we have resources and we have the indigenous knowledge. So if we can think better, maybe we can find a way to do this. Before I end this uh, first part of my talk, let's have some mental exercise. Let's think about Baguio, the term Baguio. What does it mean? Where did, where was it based from? How did it get its name? I search online, and there are three. It's uh, it means bug you, or how do you pronounce it? Bug you means flowering moss, and then there's another that says that it came from the term kafagwai. It's an Ipaloy term for clearing. And the others call it, uh, they say that it came from the term Bagyu. It's an Inibaloy term for pondweed. Even from seeing this, we can see that it indicates moisture. And the clearing, if we have moisture in a clearing on a mountain, then it means that it's probably always wet maybe it will have some problems with flooding. Next, Manila. How did Manila get its name? I again search online, and there are two. One is Manila, is a Sanskrit term for where indigo, for, for indigo, it means where indigo yielding plants grow. Or it came from Manila because ma as a prefix uh, indicates abundance of that. So indigo trees in abundance. And then there's Manilad where there are mangroves. And Manilad where mangroves are in abundance. What does this indicate? I, low lying area and in relationship with water. Um, this ends part one of my presentation. The next one will be uh, its application. We shall discuss its application, its issues, and some concerns. So, can we have a like two minute break? <laughs> And habang nag 
Uh, Bibreak tayo, we'd like to acknowledge the following local government units. Ito siguro mga DRRM uh, officers from Kibungan. Asan po kayo? Hawaii naman? Ayan. Uh, then we have from La Trinidad. Uh, si ating DRM officer of La Trinidad. Bokod. Ah, there you are. We also have from the National Commission on Indigenous Peoples, Benguet. There, we have it there. Ayan. From Penro, Benguet. Penro, Provin uh, Provincial Environment and Natural Resource. Penro? Uh, Penro, Benguet. Awan? Aha. DR, DNR. Ayan. Isan yung ating taga MGB from DNR. And of course, our students from the University of the Philippines, Baguio. Ayan. Okay. So, uh, we are very much um, lucky this afternoon na meron tayong napag-aralan tungkol dito sa na-share ni Architect Rachel Gimbatan Fajas. No? And later on this afternoon also, uh, we will have the reactors. And then pagkatapos ng ating mga reactors, it would be the open forum. Now, in our open forum, pwede naman tayong magtanong, Ilocano, Tagalog, English, anya. Oh, please feel free to ask questions. Stop no ma napintas sa interaction tayo, Madam Dama. So are we ready now for the second phase? Yes, we are. So once again, let's welcome our lecturer, Architect Rachel Fajash. Same. This is uh, this is this presentation is shorter. Probably all know all of you know what this picture is. This was in September 2018. Anyone who doesn't know this picture, this is in Itogon Benguet. It buried a lot of people, most of them Ifugaos, my province mates. Many casualties could have been prevented if the people listened to warnings. But people only listen to what they believe in and what they can relate to. So no amount of modern gadgets and early warning systems can convince everyone to heed warnings if these are remote from their conception or comprehension that a disaster is going to happen. That is why I place premium in community-based mapping and planning. For me, this is the only way for people, the local people, to internalize values of the land, its limitations, and its tendencies. The exercise, the mental exercise that we did earlier, it places us in a frame of mind. Mapping of place names is a form of guided discovery of heritage. It's um, for that, it is a good cooperation tool to rally action because it is based on common understanding of meaning, common heritage, built on common observance of natural phenomena that are indisputable in the community. They inform us and they remind us of long existing survival instructions that can still be used today. But there are limitations to community-based mapping and planning. It only works if the political environment 
is supportive and enabling. It works if there is enough follow-through until its completion. And it works if it is finalized with policy support or policy legis or legislation. This was me. The bottom picture is me in 2004, full of dreams and aspirations for the protection of my heritage. I was conducting land use planning then. And out of more than 40 barangays that we mapped and planned for, only two reach its uh, completion and policy enforcement because the, the chief executives were accommodating and friendly. So here are some recommendations. Despite having more than 100 years of experience of fighting landslides, fighting typhoons, and earthquakes, we still see disasters from the context of emergency response, not from the long-term view. Kahit nga yung DRRM offices natin sa LGU, the positions there are not permanent. And yet, we know that we are experiencing every year. So kailangan ng support dyan. Also, you cannot really capacitate people who are in the LGU, who are the front runners, or train them to do things if their term is only for three years. Napapalitan yan, you train them and, they, and then they get changed every three years kasi napapalitan yung elected official or the elected chief executive. Also, this means also that we need support for the legislation. This is immediate on high-risk areas and road design requirements. The DPWH usually only design for roads, but not really integrating the signs of water channels. So walang uh, wala yan. Dapat integrated yan sa design. And this one, this is no longer about uh, the study. I just included it. There is an immediate need for an inventory of damaged roads and infrastructure and a master plan and construction of water drainage system in every LGU. Uh, that's my suggestion as a planner. Um, kailangan din yan dito sa Baguio. It's, it's a huge challenge here in Baguio, but that should be what this city must have. So recommendations on methodology development. What I presented is not a cut and dried approach. You can change it, you can add to it, you can modify it and uh, make it fit to the barangay or community that you are, where you are facilitating mapping. Um, so nasa yoyan. Um, depending on, and it also, you also have, they, because they have unique abilities like, and unique experts, so nasa yoyan. On uh, further studies, many times during the workshops, I really wish that a geologist was there and a social scientist was, was there or an ethnobotanist to uh, observe the dynamics in the discussion. Let me read this so that I will not forget because I have written all the recommendations for further studies. Uh, there are other types of information that can still be factored in for higher accuracy. There are several geologic conditions that contribute to a landslide, 
landslide, just as there are several types of landslides in the site that may yield more information on geologic conditions, some of which can be corroborated by place names and local stories. This study, what I have just presented, only covered the presence of landslides, but also yielded information on place names that imply on the size and type of erosion. Also, there are places that were named to indicate soil composition. This can be further studied to classify landslides and the location of rockfall, block slides, earth flow, frequent loose soil or creep. Place name mapping combined with other GIS-based modeling methods is another area worth exploring for added accuracy of predicting risk occurrence with specific distances of the reach of the damage. On the social aspect, for the social uh, scientists, exploring the value of mapping a locality from the point of view of local people in their own language deserves further attention. Self-discovery of intellectual capital and the methods employed need more exploration centered on appropriate effective and relatable tools that are user-friendly. I would also um, recommend more studies on applied research. Yung may magagawa sa community. And implications on indigenous peoples. I would like to read this too. I would like to draw attention to, the, to an overlooked situation in the promotion of indigenous knowledge in disaster risk reduction management. What had become apparent to me during the research is the weakened state of our indigenous communities to harness their own knowledge in order to overcome the difficulties that they keep facing every time a disaster hits. Indigenous communities are the least provided when it comes to infrastructure support. They live in areas that are least developed and where access to basic social services is very limited. They inhabit protected areas that often restrict development, therefore offering little economic opportunities. They rank very low in the Human Development Index scale. The Sendai framework calls for ensuring the use of local and indigenous knowledge in plans and programs. But what mis must be recognized is the fact that our communities, though having inherent capacities to cope with disasters, have weakened support systems that disable us to use that knowledge. We are in a permanent state of recovering from last year's disaster or even from disasters that happened three, five years ago. Like a person who has just come out of a hospital. Jay, agrec recover pa lang a tao. You cannot just tell him to use your indigenous knowledge to solve your own problems. He has to be in a stable condition. He needs support. He needs to be healthy so that he can use his mental faculties and optimize, optimize it to solve his problems. That is our situation. In the same manner, we need enough social services and infrastructure to stabilize our capacities as indigenous peoples to realize and utilize important knowledge that is in our possession. We need infrastructure support to enable us to be productive. We would require technical assistance. And this is not the work of one. This is the work of everyone. Thank you very much for your attention. Maraming maraming salamat, Rachel. Thank you for bringing us to the province of Ifugao and uh, keeping us aware, making us aware of what is going on in terms of landslide indigenous knowledge in landslide risk mapping. So at this point, we shall ha invite our reactors. Please uh, come in front. We have two reactors for this afternoon. We have Dr. 
Dean Javier, the Dean of the College of Science, UP Baguio. He's, she is the Assistant Professor of Geology at the Department of Physical Sciences. And her research interests runs from geoscience education, rainfall-induced landslides, environmental geochemistry, and climate change. Yes, her researches include enhancing stakeholders' capability in utilizing the rainfall threshold in the landslide early warning system of Tublai Benguet. And another study is on soil stabilization through revegetation of natural landslides in Atok Benguet province. And climate change vulnerability assessment, adaptation, scenarios and strategies for Baguio City, Benguet, San Fernando City, La Union, Dagupan City, Pangasinan, and Tuguegarao City, Cagayan. And an assessment on the effects of land use on water and sediment quality in selected sites of the Agno River Basin. We have Dr. Javier, please. And the second reactor is Ms. Esther Lignachan. She is uh, the Development Management Officer for the Ifugao Provincial Office of the National Commission on Indigenous Peoples. She provides technical support and guidance in activities related to land and domain delineation and titling processes. She also conducted monitoring of compliance with terms of registration and accreditation of indigenous people's organization. She's a Humphrey Fellow from Syracuse University. And her area of focus was on public policy analysis and public administration as they relate to indigenous communities. And she's very much interested in land delineation and titling in indigenous communities, as well as the formulation of comprehensive development plans for the preservation of indigenous communities' resources. We have Ms. Esther Dignachan. We also invite our lecturer to please uh, be with our reactors. So the reactors can now give their comments and insights. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Ms. Rachel, thank you for that very enlightening uh, lecture. I'm really very pleased to have with us a kindred spirit advancing uh, knowledge on resilience to disasters, especially to landslides. Um, you know, there are not very many uh, people, and women especially, who are into earth-moving uh, research like this. And so I'm, I'm glad you, you chose UP Baguio to deliver this lecture. Um, May I also mention that the number of fatalities and affected people, cost of economic damages and damage to the environment caused by landslides have really been significant. It is estimated that landslides account for 17% of the fatalities due to natural uh, disasters. So your lecture is indeed very timely and relevant. So as a first step in understanding uh, landslide occurrence, as you mentioned, landslide inventories are very important. So I agree wholeheartedly that good, it is good and sound practice to understand landslide susceptibility, to refer to the digital elevation model, geology, um, previous maps, and expert knowledge to enrich this information um, about landslides. This research is certainly innovative and consistent with the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction. So to be uh, some recommendations for our audience in the local government units, um, and, uh, and researchers or, or national government agencies and uh, researchers. I'd like to mention that landslide susceptibility maps are living documents. They are dynamic. 
And therefore, it will certainly benefit, it will enrich these documents if we continue adding our observations to it. Um, so I would like to enjoin all, uh, all government uh, officials, uh, employees, uh, researchers to continue adding um, observations and your knowledge to landslide occurrence. Maski na, um, maski na sa tingin nyo ay uh, maliit na bagay lang o maliit na landslide ito, certainly go ahead and report it and document it. You know, we can only make good models of landslide occurrence if we have good observations from the ground. So, secondly, uh, the, the landslide susceptibility maps, uh, as I said, uh, need to be updated. It's not an end result of uh, of a certain endeavor. No? It's something that needs to be updated, something to be enriched, and it's something that is used, that is to be used for guidance. Um, so it, it's very important to have a history of landslide occurrence because any landslide susceptibility model will depend on, will only be as good as the information that goes in it. So, indigenous knowledge uh, is uh, a, a good um, input to this, uh, to this model. So, thank you again, Rachel. And thank you to the Humphrey uh, Fellowship Program for bringing your lecture to UP Baguio. Thank you. What can I say? But firstly, I would like to acknowledge the presence of NCIB Benguet, Attorney Abiyadang, and staff for coming over. This is very relevant as we are doing uh, facilitation activities at the community level regarding uh, the formulation of ancestral domain, sustainable development, and protection plans. And also from my uh, colleagues, from NCIP Ifugao, we have here Manong Roy Sambrano, Norina, and Giselle. Thank you for coming over to attend this. I encourage them to join this uh, uh, conference in order for them to realize the importance of, of what we're doing in tandem with other gov government plans. I uh, just scribbled some of uh, my reactions regarding the presentation. So recognizing the need for uh, in landslide mapping and other, uh, other mapping activities, we need the participation actually and uh, the contribution of our communities, indigenous cultural communities. So sino ba ang nakakalam, sino ang experts sa communities, kundi our, uh, those who are living within the communities. So we are doing that. But going beyond that, yung na-provide ni Raquel na pagtingin, the perspective from the communities must be understood by the ones facilitating yung planning process. So yun from, from my uh, personal uh, reaction, because we're doing the ADS-DPP formulation, uh, we're just facilitating and documenting what our community participants are saying. So in words like uh, gode, as you have mentioned, yung domang, gohang, in other areas, meron silang mga terms pa na yung place names, which should serve as historical markers of calamities. Parang um, hindi siya magandang ganun sana, pero in the minds of our community participants, yun yun eh. So an example would be nagchajan. Nagchajan would refer to a place where there was a massive landslide, Lupfu, where the, where the earth rolled up, folded up. Uh, 
uh, Goggo. Yung mga sitios, yung Goggo. Where there was uh, earthquake and the uh, and parts of that mountain uh, fell to the ground. Yun yung descriptions ng mga tao. In the ADSDPPs, they usually define or uh, describe how the community was named. So yung mga sitios na yan, it's they've written and we have translated it into English. Pero hindi na depend yung pag uh, tingin ng mga facilitators dito sa sinasabi ng community. So, thank you for the enlightenment. Together with other plans, yung first part would be having technical assistance from people like uh, weighing yung factors, causative factors and others, and how to mitigate or how to prevent further um, damages to the communities using uh, the planning process, yung next stage niya. So, yun yung nakita ko sa presentation mo, which should be implemented or employed by the LGUs together with the other national agencies who are doing or who are facilitating planning processes at the community level. And uh, for your recommendations, mostly dun sa legislation and capability building of uh, our communities. Yeah, talagang kailangan, pero yung mga career officers at the municipal LGUs, sila din dapat because they are the ones who are left behind every time an election comes and goes. So they, are, they should be capable enough to continue the work. Kasi talaga namang yun yung kanilang uh, trabaho, technical, uh, providing technical assistance to the ICCs, to the IPs. And for us, for future use, ang nakita ko rin further would be for uh, the documentation, hindi lang yung documentation per se, wherein we just put into video files, video clips, documented uh, materials, yung mga IKSPs, Indigenous Knowledge Systems and Practices, like yung when there was epohar, yung parang nag-gape yung earth, meron silang kinukwento na yung mumbaki in that place um, prayed with other mumbakis and placed yung pochong. Imagine mo yon kung lahat ng mga mumbakis mag-pray sila na mawala yung ganon. Eh, di ba? Parang it would be a miracle na fast relief for us sa disaster or preventing disaster. Pero nawawala na rin yan. It's gone when they left this earth. So sayang. Um, lahat sana din, titingin tayo sa rites, rituals, and yung practices ng ating elders where yung belief natin nakatulong. Meron pa yung sabi nila kung mangoy, nakikita nila na merong papa, paparating na typhoon through signs na sila lang nakaka-appreciate. They would perform rituals para yung hangin sa taas na ma-dissolve, hindi, hindi magla-landfall, kumbaga. But after three days of that, meron din silang ritual na gagawin para bang Thanksgiving and for also for the, the rice fields where planted rice would be uh, babalik daw yung spirits ng rice para hindi, hindi sila devastated as a community. So meron yung ganun. Another example on water management and the uh, drainage systems which were built in, in the terraces would, yung mga systems na nandun, yung meron kang koheng, meron kang liglig for fast uh, drainage. Sana incorporate din yan, hindi lang sa terraces. Siyempre, nawakwala na rin ngayon due to other factors. Incorporate din yan sa planning nung, kasi kinukonkreto na natin yung mga daan kailangan din may fast drainage sa mga daan that would not um, that would not endanger yung other parts of the environment so yun yung mga we we've taken for granted some of our researches na sana may incorporate dun sa ating ginagawa um, trabaho natin ito 
so passionately we should be of help to our communities. Thank you, Raquel, for coming back and for taking time to share yung knowledge mo. Knowledge. Indigenous knowledge with modern knowledge. Salamat po. Salamat sa UP Baguio for hosting also. Maraming maraming salamat. Napakagaling ng ating dalawang reactors. No? They gave insights, they gave comments, they did a little synthesis. And uh, we'd like to thank them and let's give them a big, big clap. No? Si Dr. Javier and si uh, Esther Lignacian. And now, tayo naman to. We will have the open forum and this shall be moderated by Paula. San si Paula? Ayan. Si Paula Pamintuan Riva. Uh, hello, good afternoon. My name is Paula. I'm from the Cordillera Study Center and I will be moderating the open forum for today. So, syempre, as we all know, as open forums go, um, please introduce yourself. Uh, raise your hand if you want to ask a question. Introduce yourself and uh, go directly to your question as directly as possible. Um, and then, I think an appropriate way to open the open forum would be if uh, Miss... Uh, Raquel uh, would like to respond to the reactors, to the input of the reactors. Would you like? <laughs> Do I still have to react? I agree with them. <laughs> That's all I can say. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, so now we can open the floor for your question. So, si ma'am po. I think we have the same eyeglasses. Thank you, Paula. Um, I'm Heidi uh, Quintana Malubay. I'm here with my husband and my daughter. Uh, I'm uh, here to thank Rachel and share her frustration and her hopes. Uh, we're, we're very good friends. Uh, at one point, she got me a sarninang sa kasal together with uh, Arnel Banyas. And sabi ko sa kanya, dapat ninang niya ako sa binyag. <laughs> so, sa binyag ng anak niya. So, uh, I'm here to validate everything that uh, Rachel said. Sabi nga ni, ni Dr. Geologist natin, um, her earth-moving and heart-moving presentation and research. Uh, I come from the Tagalog region. From My hometown is Mauban, Mauban, Quezon. And uh, it's uh, a coastal town with hinterlands. We are at the foothills of the Sierra Madres. So our elevation is not as high as that of the Cordilleras. Um, but back in 2004, I guess, or 2005, we were classmates at the UP SERP uh, School of Urban and Regional Planning. And I remember we talked about not indigenous knowledge, I called it local wisdom. And uh, extensively, Rachel went into this, rocks went into this uh, research. And for us, um, I, I went on to do, uh, as a team leader, land use planning also in my area. And uh, this is a validation of valuing place names. In our undulating hills, there is a part there where we call Dulasan. It's a Tagalog term. And Dulasan, it's where you can see population, growing population of both the living and the dead. Merong secondary cemetery kami doon. And that being Dulasan, it's really landslide susceptible. So it just validates the word Dulas, slide. So even in Tagalog. So the other one is uh, there is this uh, premier town in my Quezon province also, where we have a barangay called Hinatihan. And this is right next to a dried up riverbed. And so I, I asked before, why do you think is it called Hinatihan? Kati means either, either of two things. Kati, where you itch or scratch. And Kati, drying up. And essentially, it was a dried up riverbed area. So there is really value. 
And so, in the advocacy of what we do in educating our indigenous peoples, the Dumagas, we are calling for linguistics experts to help us preserve the language because in the language is the knowledge. It's the indigenous knowledge. And so, the frustration namin ni Rax. As planners, sometimes we're called doomsday sayers because, because of what we know. What we know what will happen given the current trends where people locate themselves. But we wear two hats. Either we're visionaries or pragmatic hats where we work on what should work. Ang sabi nga po namin as planners, yung mga nakaupo, sometimes hindi nila namang gagawin. Yung namang alam ang gagawin, hindi naman nakaupo. <laughs> so, what we want to do is bridge that gap. So, that that's what we're doing. We're constantly reaching out. And one last thing pala, in the Yolanda, because my husband headed um, for the Philippine Medical Association, yung nationwide effort for medical relief sa Yolanda. So, we went there for four missions. Yung tsunami and storm surge. Because, yun nga, it's the language where you can relate to. And that spells your readiness. Because, hindi naman, hindi naman, ngayon lang nangyayari in lahat ng ito. It's been happening a long, long time ago. Geologic years, 10,000 years. Ma'am. <laughs> so, so, this is not the first time. That's why we need to value local wisdom and indigenous knowledge. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Would you like to... Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Any other questions po or comments, Dr. Kirk? Uh, that was quite enlightening what you said. Um, uh, my name is uh, Carmen Domingo Kirk. I was born in Baguio. I grew up in Baguio. I'm going to be a devil's advocate right now. Having been born in Baguio with a beautiful house just below Terino Hill, Tarabao Hill, it was very idea. There was nothing there on the hill except pine trees, logs, and sometimes moss. Look at it now. How does it look to you? That's why I'm not very optimistic about us taking care of the environment. I don't think we believe in planning. I don't think we believe in keeping the environment. I don't think we even believe in a disaster. Why? A disaster happens. Next thing you know, another disaster happens. The, the disaster that happened before has not even been solved and another disaster is happening. What is wrong with us? Why do we not plan? And if there is a plan, how come we do not follow it at all? I'm really raising this question to all of us because I think we, I have very great faith in the Filipino people, but when it comes to disaster, but I. Yes. What is wrong with us? <laughs> this is not the work of one, as I have just mentioned. It's the work of everyone. It's the work of every agency. It's not only the DRRM who should work on this. It's the work of the people we have elected. The work of people who are working right now, working in the government. And the work of the community. That's all I can say. It is the work of everyone. Okay. Any other questions or comments from the audience? Si Attorney Banyas. Hello, um, I'm Arnel. I'm from Barangay Marulas in Valenzuela, and the word Marulas comes from the word Madulas. Uh, tinakpan na yung mga ilog namin kaya parating baha sa MacArthur Highway, tsaka na malap, marumi na yung Tulyahan River. Anyway, ang question ko, sinabi kasi ni Rachel Kena during her lecture, I heard the word expensive, and I saw the word legislation do sa presentation. So, itatanong ko lang, alin ang expensive at anong pwedeng gawin ng mga legislators? 
Thank you very much for that question. We really need support from national legislators to local legislators. Legislation uh, here in the Cordilleras, I would suggest legislations on integrating indigenous knowledge in planning. It had been um, articulated before by many planners, but we are still seeing this from the context of emergency response. Dapat base yan before we ever plan or before and when we update our land use plans and zoning, we need that information. So legislate the creation of community-based land use maps. That would be ideal. Uh, like I said, it's very expensive because workshops are very expensive. When you gather communities, it would mean food. And it's, it does not only happen once because you need to validate that knowledge. It's really expensive. And how many barangays and communities do we have? So it's really expensive. We need some budget for that. So legislate siguro na uh, lagyan ng support yung mga ganyang um, uh, efforts. Because that's the only way for the community to internalize uh, the value of their land. And that's how they can participate and take action. So it solves a bit of our problem about what's happening with us. Yes, it's expensive because how many barangays are you going to uh, uh, facilitate workshops in? And when you mean workshops, you, you have to feed them. It means time and money and food, meals. I think there's a follow-up question. I have a question from Hungary. They're watching the live stream. So they're asking you to respond if it's not awkward for you. How do you see the potential of making this practice employable in other countries for other types of risk management and mitigation? Well, it would probably be easier for other countries who were not colonized and who have their place names or their localities not changed or anglicized or hispanized to something else. So it is applicable to other countries. In, um, in Italy, for instance, the, the names of the places, like the, the areas, are uh, follow, they follow the configuration of the land. Like there's a place there that is named Mount Leon because it, it, um, it's like the profile of a lion. And it has to do something with the configuration of the rock, like uh, it's probably concave or uh, convex. It has a convex profile. <laughs> okay. Any other questions, po? From the students. Ah, okay. From Professor Salvador Amores. Um, thank you very much for that uh, wonderful lecture. It's very uh, enlightening for us because I'm also an anthropologist, and the value of place names and is very important, as well as the historical documentation of maps uh, that plays a central role in landslide mitigation or mapping. Uh, I just want to know, like, uh, a follow-up through, like, how expensive is uh, to set up in a particular community, for instance, aside from the, the workshops that will be held, uh, people coming in, technical experts coming in, are there also gadgets or equipments that you will use, like, is there like a ballpark figure that you can uh, uh, give us and maybe forward on to make a policy recommendation and then submit that to whoever would be uh, interested in this particular approach uh, through our legislators here who are here to help you out? Well, thank you very much for that comment. Uh, I forgot to mention that when I said it's very expensive because it means gadgets. Uh, this, the activity that I did for, for this research uh, is more effective if it's done in small groups. One laptop with 
uh, not more than five participants to encourage more uh, deeper interaction. So if we are to follow this methodology and the process in mapping, then it means um, buying several um, laptops and uh, probably GPS uh, gadgets and um, and yes, a budget for what the community would need. Uh, I cannot give you a ballpark figure now, but uh, in the workshop that I, I did, I own the laptop, so um, maybe um, it would need like uh, for one barangay, it would need you would need probably three, I mean, or five laptops, and um, I don't know. A workshop would last for like at least um, one day for. Um, uh, Making an inventory of the place names and uh, making and landslides, and then another day for validating um, validating the map that you have made. So it's like uh, two days, but this means small groups. If you are going to conduct this uh, in a large scale, you need trained facilitators trained local facilitators who understand the language and if possible those who grew up in the area because they are sensitive to the nuances of the language so they know the difference between this um, language and that dialect or that language so um, on a large scale we need trained facilitators so there may be for one municipality you probably would need like if there are 28 barangays, then you would need like 15 facilitators or 10 facilitators to work in each barangay with their own laptops. And they must know what they are doing. And they, can, they are keen enough to, uh, to really extract information. I, think, I hope it answered your question. Just to add to what uh, Rock said and the question of uh, Attorney Banyas, planning is in the is mandated in the local government code. Therefore, it should be in the budget. So it's it shouldn't even be talked about the budget for it. Even if it's ex expensive, it is more expensive to lose lives because of lack of planning. I think that's the follow up for, for Rachel's uh, question. Other questions po or responses to, okay, si Madam. Sir, pakibigay po kay Ma'am. Ma'am, please introduce yourself and your affiliation po. I'm Dr. Colting, an entomologist and a retired professor. Uh, we, we also started having ITSP in uh, trying to uh, come up with pest surveillance. Unfortunately, uh, by that time, I was, I was almost about to retire. And therefore, this may be a, a food for thought for the academe. Probably it would be good to integrate ITSP in uh, relevant courses. For instance, in agriculture, I think we need ITSP. In engineering, I think we need ITSP. And I think in all, almost all uh, degree programs. I, we are very uh, lucky that uh, DepEd already started in the elementary, but I think uh, we have to uh, uh, run fast in the uh, university level. Thank you. Governor is asking here how much. Galing pala kay Governor ang tanong. I can give a detailed um, breakdown. Breakdown. Mm. Give me 
one night. I can do it. Okay. A response to uh, Professor Colting from the Academy. Indeed, it's 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 also very useful for uh, best management in the in the mapping that I had done. There are places that uh, mention the abundance of this tree species or this plant species. So they are named after the abundance of useful plants. That's why I really wish that an ethnobotanist was there also. Question. Ah, oh, an announcement from Chancellor. Thanks to Dr. Colting's challenge to higher education. Um, the Department of Science and Technology, CAR, uh, has identified a uh, landslide um, management as a priority. Uh, uh, but actually, it came from me. I suggested to uh, Regional Director Nancy Bantog that if she wants to develop an RD center for indigenous, because all the o TOSDs now uh, located in indigenous regions are encouraged to uh, establish an R&D, research and development, uh, that's peculiar to the region and with uh, uh, using indigenous knowledge. And I suggested to her, why not landslides? Because it's quite relevant to the Cordilleras. It's very interdisciplinary. You can have geologists, chemists, botanists, ethnobotanists, and anthropologists and sociologists. And she readily agreed. And that's why um, we've been having a series of uh, consultations with the uh, DOST car, and this will really be a priority of the DOST Cordillera Administrative Region, and all the HEIs in the region uh, are enjoined to participate in uh, coming up with uh, inter-university researches on landslides. So maybe Raquel uh, D can partner, Raquel D and um, our other people, we can still have uh, Dr. Beckley as a uh, as a consultant, although she's doing um, mini hydro drums now, mini hydro dams in Kalinga, but he's very willing to be a consultant. He's an expert on slope management uh, as well. Diba? <laughs> so, bakit attorney the corpus? As far as slope management, she, he can still help. Okay. All right. Leia is also part of that group already that's uh, having this conversation with the OSD car. So there will be funds for this as long as we have we put forward a good proposal that's interdisciplinary. Okay. Thank you, Chancellor. Uh, any other questions, Paul? We still have time for two or three questions. From our... Okay. Hi, I'm Sukandao. I'm uh, part of the Humphrey Group from Manila. And uh, I'm just wondering... Since you are urban planners or planners, no, for the environment and all that stuff, how well we have a governor here, but how responsive are the LGUs in the in the implementation of your projects? Because a project will stay as a project; it's not, and it will remain useless if it is not implemented properly and not funded by the LGUs. Because I remembered. If you, if you, of course, I think you know Ormoc, where Richard Gomez is the, pre, the now the current mayor. We visited the area, and it's it, it is a beautiful place, but it is so prone to uh, earthquakes because there is a beautiful lake there now, but two fault lines traverse the the area. Kaya you can just go there for a while, but you cannot stay overnight because something might happen. And um, if you remember the 1991 uh, Ormoc flooding, you know, when all the maraming namatay sa entire province of Leyte because of the illegal logging, all that stuff, no? That, well, there, of course, there are natural factors, but there's also man made factors that caused, that contributed to what happened. And, um, Mayor Richard has done a lot of uh, preventive programs right now. And in fact, if you go to Ormoc, you cannot imagine that it was 
devastated. Not only in 1991, but I think also as part of the Yolanda devastation. Pero hindi mo makikita kasi nga, he is so aware of what is happening and and the um, the program of educating is not only for the adults or the um, ito mga estudyante natin sa college but they really go down to the level of the graders kasi nga unang una they're the ones really affected and very vulnerable no the the senior citizens and the very young people and and the mindset is no longer for people to feel as victims but as actors so they are trained as responders to calamities wala sa isip nila ang biktima ako so i will just wait for something to happen i will just wait for the for help from any government entity or private entity so ganun ganun yung kanilang mga pagbabago sa mindset nila and hindi na allowed yung mga kasi meron ding tumitira doon sa mga earthquake prone areas eh but they had been relocated so i'm just wondering as because we have all these landslide prone areas no like in Ifugao as Rachel said and hanggang ngayon ba tinitirahan pa rin tong mga landslide prone areas na to and yun what is the what are the LGUs or the barangays are doing so that what happened to Itogon will not happen again or at least ma-minimize yung effect in the future It's a complicated question. Um, it's really not the work of one. For instance, what happened to Itogon is a reflection of what will really happen if there are no economic opportunities where these people, the victims, come from. Of course, they would seek for other places even if it's not safe. Kapit patalim yan. Even if they know that it's, it's dangerous, they stay because they don't have any option. So that's a social problem. And it's beyond the scope, actually, of the LGU. LGUs can, if they have political will, if the chief executive has political will, they can implement um, good zoning plans and um, not allow building in unsafe areas. Before we have this um, proliferation of concrete houses, for instance, where I come from, some places were named as settlement areas. For instance, where there is water, they would say, oh, that's the, the place where the water is. And this is the Duntu or Chuntu. This is a place where it is a bit safe. This is a place to settle. If you see the traditional settlement areas in some areas of Banao and, and uh, other areas in Ifugao, they really located their places where landslides could not happen. Um, old houses were located on the convex, the convex part of the road where there are no drain, uh, uh, where there there won't be any scouring of the water channels. These are safe areas. And the rock formation is uh, uh, stable. We have a term for that also. So these days, modern houses are actually built on the natural drainways. And of course, with political will, the LGU can do it. But it's, like we said, it's, it's not really... Um, no, it's, 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 yeah. yes, it's really complicated. If there is a strong polit political will of the chief executive, then we can minimize the problem. Also, um, of course, legislators have a role too. For instance, if we make land use plans and development plans to uh, fix these problems, 
whatever is proposed in the budget should be uh, followed. Dapat, they can only um, check if the budget is really going to where it's supposed to be going because these are all planned in the executive bodies and, uh, and um, offices under the chief executive. So their, their um, cooperation is paramount. All right. Uh, last two questions po. Please try to keep your questions direct. Si ma'am, uh, the lady in pink. And then the last question uh, from attorney. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, S and Rachel, for doing this. I'm Chit Dai Takyangot, and I'm also a Humphrey Fellowship alumna. Uh, this is less a question than a comment. What you pointed out about naming places, according to indigenous memories, is very important. There's a place in Iloilo called Kalinog, where the government, where the Pinoy government proposed to build a mega dam and the indigenous people, the indigenous community there opposed it. And they were saying this is an earthquake prone area. That's why it's called Kalino. But the government said, and the DNR certified that there is no active fault there. Two months ago, nagkaroon ng earthquake sa Kalino, almost five point something in the Richter scale. And so the oppositors, the IPs there, they went to Korea to tell Korea not to lend the 9 billion loan that would fund the dam. And people from the Senate, uh, high and mighty people like Arnel Banas and Sue are here. I hope you bring the word to Senator Drilon, who is a prime uh, pusher of the Hala Mega Dam, that indeed they should not build the dam there. Number two, the Senate is now working on the land use, CLUP ba? On the law, law. Please tell them to bring in indigenous voices. I think it's high time to upgrade the value or to recognize the very important value of uh, indigenous voices because uh, um, IP knowledge has sustained our environment for years. And actually the reason we now have all these climate change issues is because, and this landslide, is because we haven't listened to their voices, why they were ignorant, barbaric. But they turned out to be the ones to conserve and preserve the environment, diba? So there's something about IP knowledge that we must respect and we must consider. So itong uh, mga tagabagyo, uh, activists, planners, LGU officials, Listen to them. You're talking about bliss. I read from your post. You're saying zoning has nothing to do with the environment. Even before the English word came out with the word zoning, IPs were already doing zoning in their ancestral domain. So let's listen to the IPs. Governor, uh, and dito si Governor. Eh. I know that you belong to an IP province. But it does not mean to say that just because this is an IP province, IP voices are represented already. So when we make plans in our provinces and cities, even if the population is predominantly IP, we have to bring in still uh, IP voices. Thank you. Do you have a response to her? I agree with her. Okay. All right. So last uh, question. You gonna go? Uh, thank you. I'm uh, Jennifer Tuli Corpus from Tubtuba, and um, I also wanted to corroborate that uh, community-based, um, you know, mapping and involving the community is really paramount uh, to getting their buy into all these things. Um, and it's very interesting for me, very enlightening to find out how your methodology, uh, methodology about using language, place names, etc. So um, it's a revelation for me, and um, it also, um, you know. This year is the year of, uh, declared by the UN as the year of indigenous languages. So um, this just bolsters, you know, that declaration that languages are really very important. But my question really is in relation to, um, you said, uh, these kinds of community-based mapping is, um, it's very extensive. But um, the one expense um, that we rarely account for is you know the time and the effort of the community. It's not monetary. It's also an expense. 
Um, and because especially now, um, there's growing recognition of the importance of indigenous knowledge, um, they're being involved naman, in fairness, di ba? But there are so many plans that they need to be involved in. So uh, you have the um, community conservation plans, you have the ads DPP, you have also in relation to climate change, there are communities that are mapping the carbon within their communities, etc., etc., and so on and so forth. So my question, um, and maybe also Ma'am Esther can enlighten us, because the ads DPP seems to be a good unifying um, you know, plan, because it's not just um, economic development, it's also protection, and protection could also include landslide and geohazard protection. So how feasible is it you know, for um, uh, the various agencies you know, to integrate or to um, para ma streamline yung time ng community for developing all these plans? And could it be done through the ads DPP process? Parang technically speaking, um, Possibly bang within one planning session, meron ka dyang biodiversity expert, conservation expert, meron kang uh, landslide geohazard expert, etc. So that we are not really um, taking up too much of the community's time and effort. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Attorney Jen. Um, we recognize that, uh, amen. And we tried to coordinate with the MPDCs previously. Uh, Parang may turfing kasi ng planning process. Eh. So for us at the NCIP, na we we rarely have uh, budgets for regular na ads DPP formulation. Nasa sayangan kami sa time talaga ng uh, communities. When they come, they sacrifice their time. Yung productive time nila for their families. So yun yung na-recognize namin. Kaya recently, as an ENP myself, uh, in encourage ko yung mga MPDCs who are ENPs in Ifugao for us to collaborate. Kasi for them, they have regular funds for their CLUPs where andun yung spatial planning, andun yung development plans, andun yung zoning ordinance. So, comprehensive na po yan. Plus their CDPs at the municipal level. And we have also yung sinabi po ninyo kanina for for others who facilitate yung forest and the uh, FLUP, forest land use plans ng DNR, we try to coordinate with them para minsanan yung workshop sana. And if they if they have a specific na pagtuunan ng pansin, we could we could segmentize but work as one. Kasi in the end, dapat magkakatugma at tuhog-tuhog yung mga developments and uh, protection plans ng community. So yun ang initial stage namin at uh, Ifugao, in Ifugao. Uh, we are hoping to meet together as planners and understand the process. For us, we understand their processes. But for them, they don't know yung processes namin. Kasi yun nga, they, they're focused on their own uh, planning processes. Maganda ring i-incorporate namin yung ganitong perspective yung as shown by Raquel kasi it would it would be the plan for the DRRMs because they have plans too they have all their maps so magandang it would be a say pilot project siguro with the, our architect and ENP here as well to help in in say one of the communities in Ifuga thank you The CLUP process already actually integrates ads DPP, forest uh, conservation plan, everything. That's why they are called during the creation, you know, the even in the initial stages of planning, they are called to participate. They are there. They are. They must be present. Uh, problema lang hindi talaga nag-attend yung iba. That's always the problem. It's it's. I had facilitated CLUP uh, planning um, many years ago, and I had always included people from the NCIP. They would come, they would attend, and some people from the DNR, DA. Everybody would attend during the first part, and then somehow, 
medyo nawala. Ganon. So, no follow through until its completion. That's an issue. Also, I had noticed that there is no coordination actually. Very weak coordination among MDRRMOs and the MPDCs, the Municipal Planning Co uh, Offices. There is surfing there. In the first year that I have conducted this um, study, I coordinated with the Provincial Disaster Risk Reduction Office head. And it was good. They uh, coordinated all the workshops. But during the second year, it was another administration. And I was uh, looking at strangers. I didn't know some of these people. I tried to work with them, but it was... Um, there was some, um, I cannot mention the word, uh, but uh, <laughs> resistance, yes. Kasi ginawa ng ano, sinimulan ng previous uh, oh, administration, so these previous people. So I had to deal directly with the permanent offices, the MPDCs, and they were cooperative. And during the workshop, the MPDO uh, people anyway were invited. So, ganun yun. CLUP, every, the process already includes all the other agencies at the uh, municipal or city level. Okay. So with that, uh, that would be the close of our open forum. I would like to thank our reactors. Let's give them a round of applause. And our speaker, of course, and everyone for participating and for seeing it through the end. I now turn over the floor to our MC. Thank you. Maraming salamat, Paula. Wow. So Teatro Amianan has housed talented Filipinos. Nandito ang buong bayan. Okay. And, of course, nandito din yung ating mga fans from Hungary no, na nag, uh, who, were, who were also part of the Open Forum where uh, Rachel resides, Budapest, Hungary. And at this point, um, UP Baguio um, would like to thank uh, our lecturer this afternoon and may we call Chancellor Revilius to please hand the token of appreciation. On behalf of the Cordillera Studies Center, uh, I'm um, pleased to present to Raquel a, a book entitled Resilience and Sustainability, 14 Narratives. This is a result of an international conference that uh, CSC um, organized uh, a, couple of, a couple of years ago. It includes uh, local knowledge and communicating these knowledges to the communities. Thank you very much, Chancellor Revilius. And in closing, may we have Dr. Roland Hippol on behalf of the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, in behalf of the Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, and of course, from Chancellor Revillos, we would like to express our grat deep gratitude to our lecture today. Um, I am really glad that I have been, well, first afraid, and then now glad and happy that I have attended this occasion, because I have learned a lot in the lecture of our uh, guest lecturer, Mom Rachel, thank you very much. And if we extend our thanks, of course, to the uh, Hubert Humphrey Alumni Association. Thank you very much for selecting UP Baguio as a host for this. And as closing, maybe I can uh, extend a few um, insights also about the lecture and maybe some summarize the challenges that were posed during the lecture. Um, I was also, similar to Dr. Kirk here, I was also made, born, raised here in Baguio City, although much younger than she is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so young, yeah. Yes, of course, I agree. It's, it's, um, age is just a perspective. It's, it's, it's a way of life. Okay. Um, in relation to that, one particular challenge that I was struck was that um, we need to uh, um, give value 
to indigenous knowledge, not only in landslide management, but in, in every uh, facet of the human community as well. I am a natural scientist, I'm a botanist now, um, by training. And um, lately I have been exposed to a lot of this, especially that I am currently involved in the creation of a special program on indigenous studies, which hopefully will be offered soon. And I have been exposed to all of this. And the, the, the value of indigenous knowledge cannot be um, overestimated. It has value. The second is that um, we cannot be disheartened. Um, we can see yung passion ni Ma'am Raquel kanina, di ba? When she was presenting, akala ko magbe-breakdown siya. The voice was cracking when she was presenting those things. And it, it, it struck me that uh, we have a person here, despite the frustration, she did it, despite all the difficulties. And this is a challenge to the the younger ones like me here in this, part, in this room here, that um, we cannot be disheartened. We have to have that giggle, that, that, that uh, push, that despite, sabi ni Mamdi kanina, despite how small your contribution is, if that can contribute to, uh, however small that is, to the, the, the bigger picture, to the grand scheme of things, that is something that we can be, that can the community can build upon. So I hope we have enjoyed our day uh, this afternoon. And again, in behalf of the Chancellor, we thank the presence of everyone to our very able uh, moderator. Thank you very much. Um, to our actors, um, thank you very much. And we hope... All of us hope for us to enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. I think we have something outside. Thank you very much, Dr. Hipol. Maraming maraming salamat, UP Baguio, for being a partner of the 20th Humphrey Voices series. Thank you so much, Chancellor Rubilius. And of course, once again, a clap for everyone. And of course, to our... Uh, main lecturer, si architect Rachel Fajas. We have outside, no, meron tayong uh, snacks doon. We have our local indigenous snacks. Yung patupat at turon. So have a wonderful evening and keep safe everyone. Uh, we just like to remind everyone to please submit the evaluation forms. I hope you filled them out na. Please leave them uh, 